Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another edition of Wow's Alive. We're here with two very special guests and my co-host, uh, Antonio Arguelles. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all you. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Oh. And, and, uh, we always start with this program live from Mexico City. Is yes. Wosa live? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like uh, both of you to introduce yourselves. Take as much time as you can. Don't be shy. And uh, why don't you let's start off? Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Stephen and uh, Tonio Arguelles, a great friend of mine and sponsor as uh, Ibar also. I want to thank you for having me here with you today. And uh, well, my name is uh, Hugo Rodriguez Barroso. I was in Mexico City, 1961. And uh, well, I was a swimmer since I was, uh, I was a swimmer since uh, I was eight years old. And then I became a long distance swimmer. And uh, after that, uh, a mountain climber, basically. Well, not just a mountain climber. Uh, just so you did what we call the peak and pond, and for those uh, people who don't understand what the peak and pond is, can you explain it briefly? Well, I had a chance to uh, swim in the channel back in 1986, and after uh, I mean after two attempts, and then 1997 I climbed Everest for the first time. And I, I, I need to say that uh, both experiences uh, changed my life. As a matter of fact, the thing is that uh, when I tried to swim the English Channel the first time in 1985, I swam for 50, uh, 51 kilometers. And uh, I, 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 I was totally finished. I couldn't finish the, my swim, uh, had the hypothermia. And I was just uh, three kilometers away from the other shore. And I say that changed my life because then I understood that I had to undertake my goals in a very serious manner. And uh, I started training very hard. And then uh, after my uh, first swim in the channel in 1986, I started training very hard in the mountains. So I ended in Everest and during the first expedition to Everest, I couldn't make it back after a summit. So uh, I had to survive nearly 34 hours uh, above 26,000 feet, uh, just very few feet below the summit. I had to spend the night with no oxygen, no tender sleeping bag, minus five or five, and also that changed my, my life. Wow. <laughs> We're going to get back to that, and uh, Ivar? I think be, before I start on me, I think for me the most impressive thing Hugo has done is, is what was that crossing you did? All oh, butterfly, swimming butterfly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, what did you do? I didn't know this. Yeah, I swam from Cozumel to Cancun, 70 kilometers butterfly. <laughs> and uh, well, that, that was really very tough, as Ivar is saying, yeah. How, how many hours did that take you, Kim? Like uh, 13 hours. Oh. 13 hours butterfly. That's, uh, that's pretty impressive. Uh. So Ugo's, yeah, Ugo's in, in, your, in your guy's club. Wow. Crazy, no. crazy people club. <laughs> yes, but tell your story. This is, your story is also very, very interesting. Well, my, mine's not so crazy, but I, I, I was actually born in the United States, a uh, Mexican father, American mother, and, and I was born in Wisconsin. Okay. But then we moved to Mexico when I was about a year old, a little over a year old. So I really, I grew up in Mexico, um, started swimming at about 10. I'm like, like Tonyo, I'm uh, one of the, uh, the, the children of the Mexico Olympics, so to speak. One of those people that saw the Olympics in our own country and said, I want to be I want to be an Olympian, and that basically just just shaped my life from then on. I, I decided, even though I was living in Mexico, I decided to go to high school uh, to the United States to to further my Olympic dream. I went to Deerfield Academy in Massachusetts uh, for four years, 
and then I went to I went to Stanford to to continue to be move on in swimming, so to speak, because that was I was mainly a swimmer. But thanks to going to the states in in high school, you know, you have to do you have to do three sports, and and so I I was always decent at running, so I started running cross country and, and track and field in high school. And, and my second year at Stanford, and Antonio Antonio knows what it feels like to be in a pool where you've got Olympic champions and, and, and world record holders in, in your lane next to you and ahead of you. And it's it just, it's, it's overwhelming. And, and in the preseason, one of the, one of the Stanford swimmers, you know, we were out running and way, way ahead of everybody else. And he says, you should try modern pentathlon. I had no uh-huh. idea what that was. And it turns out that there was this Olympic sport uh, for athletes that are a little more, uh, you know, a bar- have a more variety of, of, of skills basically for, for good runner swimmers that can then pick up the other sports. And that's where my second year at Stanford, I learned to, to fence and to ride a horse and to shoot. And, and uh, I went on to go to three Olympic games in, in, in modern pentathlon. And um, also, also competed in, in a triathlon, a professional triathlete for, for two years in the 80s when it was, when it was starting. Uh, and, and then, uh, and then you know, I, I, I retired in after my, my third Olympics. And I've just done a, a bunch of jobs also. Uh, I've, I've been a sports minister in Mexico um, for six years. I was president of a, of a football club, Chivas, which is a very yes, popular yes, football club yeah. here in Mexico, and uh, which Tonyo loves. And, uh, and and then uh, and then uh, I I organized the, the Pan American Games in Guadalajara 2011. That was a, a yeah. really a great experience. And um, and I'm currently the Secretary General of, of Pan Am Sports, which is uh, the Pan American Sports Organization that organizes the Pan American Games and has the 41 41 Olympic committees um, um, uh, grouped together in the Americas. And so we have a very busy days uh, these past few weeks yes, with uh, the yeah. Olympics and the postponing of the Olympic Games and all that. It's just, it's been, it's been a, a challenging time uh, currently for everybody. Yes. I mean, first of all, a challenging time just balancing all the different sports. I mean, that, that's that got to be just pressure, stressful every well, single day. You know, and, and I'm going to, the reason, the reason I, and, and, and this, I'm, I'm speaking to the wrong the wrong group in this, but the reason I switched to pentathlon, you know, I, I was at Stanford and the coach, originally the coach was Jim Gorham, who's a very a renowned uh, and well-known coach uh, in the 60s, 70s at yeah. Stanford. And he hired this, this young assistant uh, called Debbie Meyer. I don't know if you remember yes. Debbie Meyer. Yes. She won three gold medals at the Mexico City Olympics, the, the best distance swimmer in the world in, in the late 60s. And she came on as his assistant coach, and our mileage doubled. So we were going maybe six, seven thousand yards a day. We went to fifteen thousand, you know, at stamp. So and yeah. and it, it turned out that I was I was swimming in the morning, swimming in the afternoon, and then at night I would start dreaming that I was swimming. <laughs> I said this is too much swimming. So I, as I say, I'm speaking to the wrong the wrong group of people, and that's when when pentathlon just looked really good. And you know, all of a sudden I'm out running in a, in a golf, the beautiful golf course three, four days a week. I'm learning to ride a horse, learning to get up from the ground because the horse throws you off a lot at the beginning, learning to handle a pistol, and then learning to yeah. fence, which actually is, is a really fun sport to do. It's not fun to watch, but it's, really, it's a really fun sport to do because it's a combat sport, you know, without getting hit like the boxers. So pentathlon is actually a, a, a really fun sport in, in general. It's a balance. You balance the physical with the technical and the skills. And it's, it's a fun, you know, it's not a well-known sport. It's a hard sport because you have to learn all these skills, but it's actually, a, you know, a fun sport and, 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 and some very good athletes uh, are, are, are take part in, in, in pentathlon. So it's just an, it's a different, different kind of sport, but it's, a, it's an interesting sport. Yeah. And, and the, the roots of uh, pentathlon, you were explaining to me earlier, are very, very interesting. Can you explain how this sport came well, about? It, it's interesting because the creator of modern pentathlon is actually Pierre de Coubertin, the oh. creator of the Olympic Games. You know, there, it was his idea. In the ancient uh, games of the ancient Greece, they, they used to have the pentathlon. And the pentathlon in ancient Greece was the skills a soldier needed back in those times. And that was, they would basically, they would throw a javelin 
they would throw a discus, which were two weapons. They would run 200 meters and do a, a standing long jump. And the best two athletes at the end would wrestle each other. So, so all combat skills. That was the yeah. original pentathlon. So Pierre de Coubertin said, I want to make a sport which will determine the most complete athlete of the games. And you're talking, this is 1906, 1908. He started to dream of this idea. And he put together this, this strange combination, which was basically kind of a cavalry officer in the early 20th century. And, and, and he put together the sports. And what they say is kind of, they say it's a military messenger who has to take a message, a message across enemy lines. So he sets out on his wow. horse, has to jump over obstacles. Eventually his horse gets shot down. So he continues running on foot, has to shoot at his opponents, you know, or at, his, yeah. at, his, uh, at the opposite army, at the enemy. Then he runs out of, of, of bullets and he has to fence his way through, swim across a river and run to deliver the message. That's kind of the, wow. uh, the story they've created behind Pierre de Coubertin's uh, sport. So yeah, so we're basically uh, DHL or Federal Express employees <laughs> from back then. Wow, amazing. And then well, I want to ask you, you know, you're swimming across the English Channel and training as a swimmer. So you're using a lot of your upper body and then all of a sudden you're climbing Mount Everest and you have to use your lower body. So how do you make that transition from a upper body dominated athlete to a lower body dominated athlete? That is true. And that's a very good uh, point of view. I mean, one of the hardest things to do was to, to uh, switch from a long distance swimmer to a climber. And uh, as you said, uh, Training is totally different. And, and not only that, but uh, when you're swimming at sea, you have plenty of oxygen. You have no issues with oxygen. When you're climbing, especially in the Himalayas, then the, the more you climb, the less oxygen you find. And uh, that's a huge challenge. Uh, what I did is uh, that I was climbing Popocatépetl, which is like 18,000 feet uh, high. I was climbing Popocatépetl every Saturday, almost every Saturday. And uh, then Iztaccíhuatl, which, which is uh, another mountain just uh, close to Popocatépetl. They're two hours away from Mexico City. And I used to sleep on the top of uh, Iztaccíhuatl uh, almost every weekend. I mean, at least for the very last uh, two months before my expedition. And that gave me a strength to at least uh, adapt myself to live at base camp. Base camp is almost uh, as high as Sista uh, Siwat and Popocatépetl. So I, I, I was not worried about uh, uh, really being able to stay for two months uh, on base camp. I was worried about uh, acclimatize myself to high altitude because I, I had to climb all the way to 28,000 feet. And I'm um, Everest, you have uh, base camp, then four camps. Uh, camp four is at 26,000 feet. I mean, that's really, really high. And you have like probably one third of oxygen. So uh, I would say that's a, a, a a great challenge uh, as, a, as a long distance swimmer, as a swimmer, but also I think that uh, being a swimmer gives you so much advantage because uh, as we all agree, I'm pretty sure, I mean, because we, Tonio and me and Ivar, we have talked about this. When you're a, when you're a swimmer, you need to tra train very hard. I mean, you swim like a lot, I mean, sometimes you have to swim 20 kilometers a day and, and that gives you uh, an outstanding strength. So when you're climbing, you, you're not going to be worried about your strength, your physical condition, because you have it there and you have it there uh, f from years back. So uh, the, key, the, the thing here when you're climbing, you need to be very smart while you're trying to uh, get used to the lack of oxygen. And, and that's, let's say, kind of not so difficult if you're just taking easy, if you climb to camp one, then you get back to base camp, you take a rest for three, 
days, four days, then you go camp two. And uh, if you are doing this process in a smart way, uh, I think that you're ready to go all the way to the summit. Wow, wow. And then, Ivar, you, you and all of us here, we, we start out as swimmers. And uh, swimmers are very coordinated if we do freestyle, breaststroke, backstroke, butterfly. But now you've got to be on a horse. You've got to be, uh, you know, using a, a sword to fence, uh, shooting. All of this, like, well, is, is he's using different muscles, mm -hmm. different parts of his body to swim or climb a mountain. You're using all different kind of techniques from translating from swimming to running to fencing to uh, shooting. Um, how do you, how do you learn that? How do you, how do you manage to, uh, you know, shoot a gun well and fence well and ride a horse well? So in my case, I probably, I probably started a little bit late. In other words, I discovered this sport when I was 18, almost 19 years old. And I'd never ridden a horse really, you know, as, as, you, as you need to ride a horse to get to jump over four foot fences and that it, it's, it's a different skill set. Never fenced and I never, never really shot a pistol uh, or other than at the, at the fairs or something of, of that sort. So, so yes, it's completely different. Not, not only is it, is, it, is it physical, it's mental. You know, it, it's, it's a different mentality. And I would say I was very close to winning the Olympic medal in, in Los Angeles. I finished seventh and our team was fifth. Uh, so we were pretty close to the medals. I basically lost the medal in, in, in the shooting event. I was, I was probably the best runner swimmer in the world to combine the combination of those physical sports. But a shooter has to be, uh, it's, it's not just different physically, it's mentally. It's more of a Zen, you know, people that can remain calm and, and, and not let the pulse, their pulse shoot up. And it's just, it's a different personality almost, no? And, and a fencer needs to be, aggressive but at the same time kind of deceitful so and, and then in, in the writing you you need to you need to make sure you you have uh emp empathy and synchronicity with the horse because uh -huh. in pentathlon is they're not our own horses you you go wherever you go in the world they provide the horses and it's the draw and, and you, you, know, you have 20 minutes to get to know your horse uh -huh. you make it a really strong fiery uh you know a horse that wants to jump or you make it a lazy horse which, which basically was trying to get out of every jump and you need to push the horse onward. So you need to, you need to learn these, these different, I'd say more skills, uh, but yeah, I mean, certainly different muscle groups, you know, you, you develop a, a more, I think a more rounded uh, physique uh, than, than just from swimming. I mean, you look at the top level swimmers in the Olympics, uh, their lower body generally are not very well developed. It's mostly from the waist up. No, and so I think when you look at fencers or even cyclists, for example, they have very strong lower bodies, you know, and, and they try to minimize their upper body. So, pentathlon, I think, is, is you just need to have a, a more rounded uh, physique, and I think that that just helps. I think it's 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 a, it's kind of a good lifetime sport, or I think just cross training and doing different different sports, I think, is a is a healthy way to do it. And I know even even uh, Tonya, who who's, who's keeps doing these crazy distance things. I know he still cross trains a lot and I think yeah. that helps keep them, keep them healthy. And I think in general, uh, my, my, my message from all of this, from a training perspective, and, and, and I think Ugo also ratified that is, is, is if, you, if you do a little more cross training, I think it helps you overall from a health and, and injury free kind of, uh, you know, for us that like to continue to be active uh, into our latter years. Yeah. Yeah. And both of you have spoken about the mental part of your sport um can you speak where how do you why do you think swimmers both of you came from the swimming world were so tough in your land activities is it is swimmers are accustomed to training so hard and you're only looking down at the bottom of the pool and now you're looking up at an ocean or on the top of a mountain or in your case you know trying to win a medal with a gun, how, how do you how do you train your mind to do to achieve what you're trying to achieve? Go ahead. Um, so I, I well, in, one of the things I did I didn't mention, but I was also a swim coach for about six eight years. When I I, I dropped out of Stanford to do pentathlon, in other words, I, and I told my parents, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to drop out of Stanford. They said that's fine, but you're going to have to find a job. And the job I found was to be a swim coach, and that made me 
really get into the and study the the swimming kind of as a science from you know from everything that was available back then. I, I think swimmers are, are are one of the most disciplined athletes in in the world, and and I, you know I, I saw this from kids that were seven or eight years old all the way up to older swimmers. The the level of self discipline that that a swimmer has, I haven't seen in many other sports. You know that they're able to get up at four 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 fifteen every morning to go to the five a.m. workout and do this 10, 12, 15 times a, a week. Uh, and the level of, of punishment and, and pain you have to, to endure to be a successful swimmer, I think it's just, uh, and as you said, you know, the, the monotony a little bit. And, you know, you talk to some really good athletes from other sports and they say, I don't know how a swimmer does it. I couldn't do that to just be in the same, the same uh, doing the same, the same activity. So I think it makes you mentally very strong, you know, when, when, the coach says we're gonna go ten times a thousand, or we're gonna do a hundred hundreds, which Antonio <laughs> loves loves to do that series. That's a great series. Now, now I have a new one. <laughs> ten one thousands. How much? Now the same. Ten <laughs> one thousand. One thousand. Okay. Yeah, that's that, that's the new that's the new Tonio. <laughs> if you think that's fun. I'm like, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I'm doing that tomorrow. I'm doing that tomorrow. <laughs> So, so, I mean, here, don't you just explain why <laughs> swimmers are successful and have the mental discipline it takes to be successful. And, you know, a lot of swimmers and, you know, one of the people I competed against in triathlon just once was a very young Lance Armstrong in, in one of the triathlons I did. I actually passed him in the running. In the running. He was still not as well-rounded as he, as he got to be later on. He came from swimming as well, you know. Yes. So, yeah. so he... I'm sure a lot of his success had to do with his, the discipline you get you get from swimming. That's 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 certain. No? Yes, yes. Hugo, can you explain it in a very concrete way what you had to think about when you were at top of Mount Everest and you had to stay there for uh, how many? You, you stayed there a whole night, a whole day, right? Up at the Mount Everest when you were trapped at the top. Yeah. Well. Yeah, that's right. Well, first of all, once you reach the summit, you're so glad that you don't have to climb anything more in the mountain. I mean, the, the, I mean, you, you, you get very happy and uh, just the feeling of being on top of Earth, the top of the world is amazing. Uh, the, the fact is that you cannot stay in summit for more than, uh, let's say, half an hour. So what happened back in 1997 is that uh, when I was climbing to Camp 4, uh, and once at Camp 4, I had this uh, flu and I had fever, and then I was uh, kind of uh, weak. So I had decided if I should uh, climb all the way up to the summit or I just got to turn around and get back to base camp. But I mean, I have tried two years to go to Everest to join this expedition. And I decided to, to try to go out and uh, to push for summit. So when I made it to the summit, I was, uh, I was very tired uh, and uh, once I was heading back and uh, right uh, the Hillary step, I suddenly lost my energy. I just couldn't move. I, I fall down and I just couldn't stand up. Uh, there was still a Sherpa with me. We were the only two people on the mountain, I mean, uh, around the summit. And then I explained to him that I just couldn't go down, that he had to go down, otherwise we both would die. And uh, he understood that, so he went back to base camp, but uh, I didn't have any energy to, 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 to try my descent. So I had to stay there. And uh, not minding that uh, you, never, you never sleep at such altitude, I just just fall asleep, and uh, I slept for like probably two hours. When it was 5:30 uh, p.m., I woke up, and then uh, I realized I was in trouble because 
I was right there at Hillary Step with no energy and there was a storm coming, heading to uh, the point where I was. And I, I understood that I had to uh, go down at least for uh, 100 feet or if possible a little, a, a little bit more than that. So I found my way to stand up and then uh, I had to climb up South Summit and I had no energy. I mean, South Summit is not really very high, but I didn't have any energy. And uh, God helped me on my mountain and uh, as a swimmer. Uh, and I managed to climb up to South Summit and then I just had to uh, try to reach like uh, 8,600 meters where I thought that I was, I was going to be more protected from the storm. And so once I, I, I was there, I, I, I decided to stay because it was going to be very no storm. It kill me and uh, I decided to stay around uh, 8,600 meters above sea level, just 300 away from uh, less than 300 meters away from summit, from uh, the summit. And I stayed there all night long until 5 a.m. in the morning with no oxygen, no sleeping bag, uh, no tent. And the reason I think I'm still here is because God gave me an opportunity and the mountain, my mountain gave me a chance. I found myself able to be part of the mountain. I think that helped me a lot. And then uh, I managed to uh, go down to Camp 4 the day after, and I arrived to Camp 4 around 9 morning. Uh, and that's what uh, the first thing cool. if, if I can, if I can in, in, in interject, just uh, I actually read this description, Ugo's, Ugo's book, so it's a good, good time to, to put in yeah. an ad for for his book, just like 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 Tony for very good books that describe the experience, and I, I clearly remember he said at some point he, he understood that he he might he might not live through the night, which I think is is a pretty impressive, really, really, you realize that you may you know that you learn you could have die and 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 you you basically put yourself I guess in God's hands or, or in, in destiny and fate whatever's going to happen, but I think that's a pretty pretty strong realization at that moment. And the other thing, Hugo, that you, I guess you didn't mention is the fact that, um, you know, when you are, when you decide to, to um, sleep that night, I remember you, you, you make it like a cave. You went in, in a moment that uh, when you told me, when you told me the story that it was very impressive, is what you tried to put the adrenaline injection. Yeah, that's right. Uh, when I was at the killer step, and I, I I couldn't find any energy to to keep on descending. Uh, I had two injections, uh, and then I tried to uh, to to use those, but uh, once I opened them, they were totally frozen, just like in I mean, no time. It was so 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 fast. And so I, I didn't have uh, any other resource to, to, to go down. So in the end, uh, I managed to, to go down the day after. And uh, I want to thank uh, Ivar Antonio because Ivar, he sponsored me three times. Uh, Antonio, uh, he sponsored me three times as well. But not only in my first expedition, but they trust me and I, I was able to go back to the mountain in 1999 and year 2000. When I was heading back to camp for the first time, uh, there was a point when I just look at the mountain and I asked the mountain, what was that I had to do? Uh, because the mountain allowed me to, to be alive. And uh, I didn't know what to do back then, but uh, then 1999 and year 2000, I went back. 
went all the way up to camp four, 26,000 feet, and with a group of Sherpas, we brought down nearly 500 kilos of, that's like almost 1,000 uh, pounds, I believe. It was the way uh, I could thank my mountain of, of, of uh, the mountain allowed me. I mean, uh, I'm a survivor because of God. These two guys, we're thankful with them. And rest of my life. Uh, just a question, Ugo's book. Uh, challenge is you have to swim a hundred meters. It can be it can be short course under your age. 60, 60 seconds uh, last year. So I'm hoping to stay stay faster than my age in the hundred meters. No, I I. My, my 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 counting is different. I just want to see how how much long how many more hours can I swim as I go older. So now I'm up to 24. So we'll see how how far I can go. Hugo, when we were training for for Mount Everest, because after I finished my first uh, English Channel, I said. person that really enjoyed when you and I were up in the mountain is how well you knew the mountain. And I remember suddenly, you know, we're on top of, um, on, on Isla Cihuatl, and suddenly we're covered by, by, you know, we have all these uh, clouds coming down on us. And I'd ask you, how are we going to find our way down? And you said, look, I'll show you. And then you lower yourself to the, to the, to the floor. And said, look, you know, we lower ourselves to the floor, we'll find our way. And I remember that as one of the greatest experiences because I would have been, I was so afraid at that How, how did you learn to be the mountain? Well, I think that uh, as uh, you, Tonio, and Ivar just said, I mean, said earlier, I think the more you train, uh, the, the better you're ready to face any kind of uh, condition. I mean, if you train very hard, if you're there in the mountain uh, as often as you can, then you just like absorb the energy and also you get involved in the mountain as, uh, as if it was your home. And then I, I think that's uh, like, uh, the, the, like the best way to, to, to learn any kind of sports. That I think that training or practice, practice, practice is like the main rule of all of this also for your mental condition, as Ibar said. So uh, I think that uh, whatever you're gonna do in your life, you really need to be very committed and you need to be totally focused and you need to practice, practice, practice as uh, uh, Americans say. Yeah. I, I have a, what really strikes me as incredible is of course you guys are practicing, of course you do different uh, training, etc. but you know, you failed across the uh, English Channel your first time. You had a very traumatic and difficult uh, summit, but you continued to try to do the English Channel. You continued to return to Mount Everest again. And uh, Ivar, in your case, it must have been difficult. Every time you fall off the horse, you have to get back on. Swimming and running, I understand you can handle it, but all of the new sports, it, it's, a, it's a process of failure and then going again. Fail, get better. Fail, get better and better. What drives you two gentlemen to, to overcome that failure? I mean, a lot of people can say, ah, you know, it's over, it's finished, it's okay. But you two continue to challenge yourself in every way. Can you explain your drive? I, I think it has a lot to do with how how much you want to to get your, your goal. In my case, my goal at first was to be an Olympian. And I remember this was right after the 68 Olympics. Uh, I grew up in a 
in a city about an hour south of Mexico City, Cuernavaca. And the coach brought us all together and said, we just saw the Olympics. I want everybody to look around and raise your hand if you raise our hand. But I was the only one of that group to, to become an Olympian. And it's just that I, I was obsessed with that. It's, you know, to do whatever you have to do to, to, get, to get to the goal. And the goal is, is it drives you every single day. You wake up and you're thinking of the goal. And, and I, know, I know Tonio and Hugo understand this very well because they're, they're very, two very driven individuals. You know, I brought a lot of swimmers over to pentathlon, people that were kind of tired of just swimming and wanted to do pentathlon. I could tell if they were going to be successful the first time they fell off a horse, you know. Did they, did they bounce right back up even though they'd hurt? Or did they walk away from the horse kind of, you know, uh, rubbing their butt because, they, you know, they, they were, they were it, it, it had hurt the fall, it hurt them. And you can tell right away who has that drive and who doesn't, you know, and, and who, who can overcome these, these, these setbacks. And in that sense, yeah, the people that, that reach their goals have to be really obsessed every day with, with, with reaching them. And I think that's, that's the strength. And I know, I know I'm preaching to the choir here because everybody in this group is, is, has that kind of mentality. But, but it, it's definitely, I think, what it, what it takes from my perspective. Wow, thank you. Hugo, and you? Uh, well, I totally agree. Uh, I mean, you need to try and you need to try and you need to try it again. And uh, the more you try uh, with passion, strength, discipline, I think that that will give you the, the, the chance to achieve your goals. Uh, and also, I believe that uh, sometimes we just look at what we accomplished. But sometimes we fail more than that that we accomplished. And, and, and that's very important because it becomes part of your life. You understand that you're not going to win every single time. And I think that gives you even more strength. So uh, as Ibar said, you, you, you just need to be committed. And uh, it's not very hard to be committed. Just you need to be convinced not only of what you're doing, but uh, of yourself. And uh, I think that's the key. Yeah. Um, oh, where, where is this uh, photo? How high are you at, on this photo that uh, Antonio is sharing with us? That's the summit. That's, that's uh, the okay. summit of, of Everest. And that was the first expedition. Just uh, half an hour after that photo was taken, uh, I was in trouble uh, when I couldn't go down. I couldn't go back to Camp 4. Yeah, those, that's a those beautiful are the, place. Those are the, pra those are the prayer um, flags, yes. aren't they? Yes, that's right. That's right. Okay. Why you, you took... You, you took those with you? Well, no, uh, I, I didn't take them, but uh, Sherpas that climbed that day two hours before, and uh, Sherpas, they always uh, fix uh, the flags everywhere they go. And uh, it, it's part of, uh, like, let's say, uh, a ceremony to the mountain. Uh, and that's be very beautiful because. When you arrive to base camp, just the beginning of the expedition, you join the Sherpas uh, with the Tibeta, Tibetan ceremony. And you fix the uh, praying flags at base camp, then camp two. And uh, well, also uh, on, on the summit of Everest. Uh, I, I want to shift a little bit to um, what you gentlemen, including you, Antonio, would advise the young athletes. So we have this unfortunate coronavirus around the world. And uh, Ivar, you know very well the impact of delaying Olympics one year. So all of these athletes are, are focused on going to Tokyo and representing themselves and their country. And all of a sudden, it's one year in the future. Um, it, all, I'd like to hear from all three of you. What advice would you give those young athletes? Um, you know, if you were their coach and you put your, their, your arm around them, what, what would you whisper in their ear? What would you advise them to do? Go ahead, in, in, any one of you. 
So this has been this has been a, a big issue with with uh, the Olympic athletes or Olympic hopefuls from all over the continent this this year. We've actually had a a lot of this, and, and we've we've organized a series of of um, uh, through the Pan Am Sports channel. Uh, we have uh, talks with experts, and the first two we had because those were the ones that were most requested was for the mental the mental and the mental health side. Uh, with two experts, one one from Spain for the Spanish speakers, and then an American for for the English speakers, and and they both really spoke about that one we have to uh, first accept what you can't change, and we we can't change this. There's things beyond our control, and we need to accept that first, and, and basically look at the things that we can control, and try to focus on the things that are under our control, which is the kind of training that we can do in our current situation. Uh, in the case of the Olympic athletes, also understanding that everything has moved back a year, that there's no, re no, no reason to overstress uh, because of that. But I think the main message that, that I got from both of these experts in, in the field of mental training was that you, you really need to focus on the things you can control and, and, and really uh, make, make every, everything from the perspective of your own initiative, what things that you can do, really focus on that. Otherwise, you know, everything else is just, um, it, it's kind of a useless exercise in, in, in worrying and, 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 and giving yourself stress you don't need. So, you know, hope, we all hope this is a temporary situation, something which will be over in hopefully three or four months at the most. And so basically we need to make the most of this time. And a lot of, a lot of the advice also was, it's a good chance to 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 refresh, maybe to read some books you haven't read, to to learn something you've been wanting to learn, to to, to use this time to to do something productive that will help you be a better person, be a better swimmer, be a better whatever it is you're trying to be uh, after this is over. Uh, is there a website where people, swimmers and other athletes, can uh, listen to these two talks, one in Spanish, one in English? Y yes, there is. It, it's. Uh, our, our normal website, you can go from there to the other, to the channel. It's, it's Pan Am Sports, Pan Am Sports dot org or Pan Am Sports channel dot org. And, and these, 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 these talks are there for Spanish and English speakers. And they can, they can look at them even though they, they were, they were held last week. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, Stephen, I'm not an Olympic and I was never an Olympic uh, um, athlete. Um, as you all know, but I was training for the, my double crossing of the English Channel. And um, I guess I obviously I'm not in the same spot as, um, you know, the young Olympia hopefuls, but um, I have dealt, and this is what, what my, my, um, my suggestion I would, uh, I, I would give to one of these athletes is, um, don't despair, um, because as, as Ivar says, there's, uh, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, in, in terms of the Olympics, you know, at least um, you have a new date, and that's June of next year. And um, in the case of the, of the channel, um, we, we don't know what's gonna happen. I talked to Mike Oram, and he doesn't know what's, what's gonna happen. But I think that this idea that uh, you just have to, to live with it and understand that it's nothing you can do to change it, it's a great advice. And then the second one I would give is keep going. You know, life is always full of surprises. And, um, and uh, if you cannot adapt to different circumstances, you will never be able to survive. And uh, this is a moment that uh, I think a lot of the, the, the athletes, it's going to be a big, a, a big shift. Those who can adapt and say, look, I will take this time to do different things, mental training, read books, do something different, and deal with it. And they're the ones who are going to feel the weight of the change and won't be able to overcome it. Yeah, thank you. And Ugo, you? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Well, what I would say is that every single day that you have trained counts and counts a lot. And that's gonna give you a great advantage 
So you need to be confident on uh, your training for years back. And also, uh, I think that uh, they need to be calm and understand that everyone is facing the same circumstances. So uh, it's, it is what it is. And uh, in the end, they have the strength and, and, and they have the ability to get back on track and to do as well as they were just doing one month ago. And I'm pretty sure they won't have just that because they have this in their heart and they're the best athletes in the world. Yeah, thank you. And um, I want to end up, and you could explain as long as you want, but um, you're all over 50 years old but I can see the drive within you. What is one or two or three things that each of you want to accomplish from this point on? You, your lives have been so incredible. Uh, you've achieved so much. Uh, you are the leaders in your field, but give us some things, your goals from this point forward. Go ahead, one, one at a time. Yeah. You know, I think, I think we're at a stage in our lives where, and, and Antonio's very active in this, it, it's, it's one you want to give back, you know, whether it's as a coach, as a teacher, as, as a, through, through initiatives, a nonprofit, or even business ventures, but you want to give back. You want to, you want to try to, and, and, and teach other people and, and give back because uh, uh, it, it's only, I think it's only fair, you know, when you're, at this stage in your life, you're able to to help others along, um, and, and and I think this is something that's good. But the other thing that I that I found, and I think it's everybody needs to understand their own their own true true self, is um, I, I enjoy competing, and I'm probably going to enjoy competing till I'm 90 or whatever whatever my limit is. I I just that I'm, I'm very competitive. I know, I know. Just now? Understands this and Just knows. now? Uh, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to continue swimming masters and doing masters triathlon and, and, you know, trying to beat people 10 or 20 years younger than me. It's just, it's just the way I am, you know, and it's, I think, I think we need to accept who we are, especially this late in life. We can't really change it. And, uh, and, and, you know, and it's, it's just something I, I enjoy it. And that means, of course, that means, that means trying to stay healthy, trying, trying to eat well, trying to, to, to train, you know, wisely as opposed to, to just, uh, uh, just going hard all, all the time. It's just, you know, interesting. I train at one hour, one and a half hours a day. That's all I train. So I consider myself a high level athlete still. So I'm still kind of training with the same intensity. Because that's who I am, you know. <laughs> you have to learn to accept who you are, enjoy it. And and the other part is is you know, uh, and it, it's especially hard right now. But you know, stay in touch with your friends. I think and with your family, it's just you know, keep that social connection. I think is also one of the biggest things that you can do to have a good a good quality of life uh, at this stage of our lives. You know, I will I will I will give the word uh, you know the, the microphone to Hugo so he can he can um, make his comment. But just to understand, Stephen, in our audience how competitive everybody is. I mean, we've been friends for many, many years, and I'm the godfather of his son, who's the goalie for the, uh, for the, the LA soccer team. Um, so I get a message from him that said, you won't believe my workout. And so he tells me the workout. I mean, he's enjoying because he knows I'm not going to be able to keep his face. And he, I know he wants to put it in my face and he's, you know, going, you know, doing this, Repetitions at 120, 115, and you know, he's very good at that. So my response is, I'll see you next week at uh, um, 15, 16 degrees water, and we're going to swim for five hours. So I have to level with him, because otherwise I will feel trash all the time. So that's how competitive, and, uh, you know, and we are both over 60. So uh, that gives you an example. Uvo, what do you want to accomplish? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh... One of the things I've been doing while practicing sports, and especially in, in these three expeditions to Everest, is that I have mixed it with a social campaign. And uh, again, I was able to do that because of Tonio uh, and Ivar. 
uh, and uh, thanks to them, I was doing an environmental expedition in year 2000, and I still want to do more of this. As a matter of fact, right now, I'm in a project. I have a foundation and uh, I just created last year an index to measure the impact of anybody in the planet, uh, any person, not minding race or gender, anything, to understand what's the impact each of us provoke to Earth. I call it Hugo Index, not because of my name, but it means Habitat Undoing and Greenhouse Emissions Outrage Index. And that's one of the things I want to promote to Everest tomorrow, I would go to Everest tomorrow. But uh, that's not easy. I mean, of course, not, not Everest is closed this year. What I mean, if I had a chance to go next year or year after, what I'm uh, planning to do in 23 years time is to become the oldest guy to climb Everest. So wow. I still have a little time to train. <laughs> How old will you be at that time? Mm. Uh, I, I was uh, no, I, in in twenty three um, years. I, I'm fifty nine now. I mean, last last week it was my birthday. I have uh, like twenty two, twenty three years to get ready for my <laughs> expedition to Earth to be the oldest guy to climb all the way up to the summit. So the guy who who is the oldest is like is eighty year eighty one years old. So I need to be ready to. <laughs> uh, uh, I think you're talking to three sixty-year-olds that think think they're forty. They think they're forty still. <laughs> yeah. Well, we I I interviewed a, another man. He was sixty years old, and I asked him, "How old is he?" And he says, "I'm twenty-nine." <laughs> and I said, "You don't look twenty-nine." He says, "No, I celebrated my twenty-ninth birthday, thirty-one years." <laughs> uh, but uh, this this has been a. Uh, I could sit here and listen to you gentlemen for hours and hours and hours. And, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm glad Antonio, you put up, uh, Hugo's book. Um, I'm going to order it on Amazon today. I'm going to, uh, listen to the, um, uh, uh, talks that the, uh, you know, the, uh, Spanish speaking and the, uh, English speak American, um, uh, I don't know, psychologists or whomever uh, gave to your athletes. This is wonderful. And, and Antonio, I have your book on my uh, reading list. So uh, you're going to, all three of you are going to keep us motivated for a long, long time. And I thank, thank you. you very, very much for your time. Antonio, do you have any last? Yes. One? Well, I would like to thank uh, Hugo and, and uh, Ivarda. They accepted our invitation, Stephen. And um, just for our audience, next week, we're gonna have uh, uh, two. We're gonna have two women in our program, um, and both of them are very good friends of uh, Hugo, Ivar, and myself. We're gonna hear from Carla Willock how she um, summit the seven summits, which is uh, always the when we talk about the Ocean Seven, we say that it's the equivalent. Of and uh, we'll have uh, Maria Holley, who um, um, did last year, Ocean 7. And it'll be a really interesting talk because we're going to uh, see, again, two different views of uh, two persons who are very, um, both very accomplished, uh, not only athletes, but uh, um, people. And um, that would be interesting. So we hope uh, our audience uh, comes back next Friday at 8.30 Pacific Standard Time, um, 10.30 in Mexico City. And we'll sure enjoy a great um, program. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I can't imagine the little house parties you have with all these famous people doing all kinds of amazing things in uh, Mexico City, Antonio. Amazing. Well, thank you very well, much. Let me we'll tell see. you that what, what... Go ahead. No, no, no. One of the fun things is, you know, uh, one thing that Ivara and Hugo haven't said is that, you know, we look forward to what we're going to be doing past. And talking about the past and what we used to do, so it's also very much fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. well, you know, Thank you very reason, much. The reason just... why Tonya went to Stanford was because of you. <laughs> he, would go to, he would go to my fraternity parties when he was uh, <laughs> <laughs> in high school. And I said, "This is I, I want to be here." Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. well, no, it's, Thank been, you it's been a pleasure, Steve. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Tonya. It's a pleasure to be with you guys today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Adios.